Let's switch gears here. We were going to have a discussion on gun safety regulations or gun control, however you want to look at it. But we had some scheduling conflicts, so half of our panel can join us, and we're going to revisit uh, this issue again soon. Let's bring in our guest, Senator Mike Testa. Senator, good to see you, man. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me again, David. Always a pleasure. So let me start on guns. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today, but we're going to move around a little bit. Uh, so let me start on guns with the Supreme Court ruling this summer that struck down New York's gun carry laws. Tell me your feelings on that. You know, look, I, I believe that the Bruin decision was the right decision. And Justice Thomas, when he stated that the Second Amendment must be treated as all other rights are protected by our United States Constitution, I believe his analysis was spot on and correct. And as he specifically put it, that the right to keep and bear arms in public for self-defense is not a second-class right. And as I've said, sort of carrying on in that tradition, that the Second Amendment, just because it's the Second Amendment, doesn't mean it's a second-class right pursuant to our United States Constitution. So what's that going to mean in your mind to uh, New Jersey, where we have, as people always say, the toughest gun laws uh, in the country. What's the impact of that decision going to be on New Jersey? You know, I truly believe that now the law abiding Second Amendment exercising citizen is no longer going to need to demonstrate the justifiable need to bear arms. Um, you know, put, putting forth a justifiable need to exercise a constitutional right is something that's completely unheard of and any other context when it comes to a constitutionally protected right. You know, I, I really believe that this was always a dangerous policy for the law abiding gun owner. And, and I really think of the, you know, the single mother who has a restraining order against either an ex-husband or an ex-boyfriend who was applying to be able to lawfully carry a gun and was denied the ability to carry that gun because they were unable to demonstrate the quote unquote justifiable need, which I believe was really arbitrary and capriciously applied to any any applicant. It was let's let's face it, David, it was almost impossible for any private citizen to show a justifiable need in order to carry a firearm in the state of New Jersey. And, and I think of that awful case of Ms. Carol Brown, who was killed in her driveway, even though she had a restraining order in place, a final restraining order in place, and she had done everything correctly. She had done everything correctly, and she applied to get a firearm and demonstrate that justifiable need. But her her firearms ID card was delayed, and she was unable to lawfully exercise her Second Amendment right, and she was killed in her driveway. So we've seen an increase in, in permits and an increase in gun ownership not necessarily as a result of the Supreme Court ruling, because it's been happening for several years now. Um, people say, you know, it's all about uh, safety and so on. Uh, so is crime that bad in New Jersey that we need to arm ourselves against it? Well, I have to be honest with you, David. Look, we've seen a, a huge uptick in car thefts right out of people's driveways. And I'm not saying that people should be using a firearm to protect their car. Um, however, with bail reform, obviously, we've seen a lot more violent crimes. We've seen an uptick. I mean, there's no there's no doubt about it. The statistics are there and people want to exercise their Second Amendment right as given to them by the United States Constitution. I, I understand that, Senator. But in a, as a practical matter, I mean, you talked you gave the example, someone getting their car broken into in, in you know, in their driveway or. Um, you know, someone who, who's at home, uh, and this is something that uh, Second Amendment rights advocates always use as an example, too, of someone coming into your home, um, you know, in the middle of the night or whatever. That is also extremely rare. So uh, when you hear people express concern about that, about so many people having guns, Shouldn't we uh, give shouldn't that give us pause? I mean, someone with a gun shooting at someone stealing their car. I mean, that's not an appropriate response, do you think? Not in the state of New Jersey. It is not. Look, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I happen to know the laws pretty well. You can't really use a, a firearm in the state of New Jersey to protect your property. And while it may, in fact, be rare that the home invasion occurs when it occurs, guess what? 
the homeowner absolutely needs to have a firearm in their possession. And I, and I think of the rural communities, many of which that I represent, who don't have local police departments. The response time from state police is over 10 minutes. If, if Even if the homeowner is home with family members and, and calls the police and does everything that they can, the state police may arrive to just make chalk lines. Um, you know, if someone's breaking into someone's home, I believe that they should be allowed to lawfully exercise their Second Amendment right and utilize a firearm. I, I, you know, I, I can't can't think of a scenario where someone is breaking into another person's home and that person who's the homeowner thinks that their life is not in danger. I, I can't think of that scenario. So while it may be rare, guess what? It is really justifiable in that instance, David, for the homeowner to exercise their Second Amendment right lawfully. In that example, then, you would say that any kind of law like the safe storage law that's being proposed um, you would be against that, the safe storage that says keep your gun locked over here and your ammunition locked over here. That's completely impractical. And I, I have to be honest with you. Look, I have three children. I will tell you anybody that has a firearm or multiple firearms in their house should it should not keep a loaded firearm in arm's reach of you know their, their young children. However, guess what? At night, while they're while they're in their bedroom alone, they should be allowed to have a firearm just in case. Especially if you think about our more urban areas where break-ins are, are frequent. Guess what? I think of that single mother scenario who may need to use a firearm to protect her children. I just don't understand the laws in the state of New Jersey always seem to be against the lawful gun owner who's there to protect their family, not their property, David. I want to be very clear on that. If someone is, is stealing someone's car, call the police. That's what you're supposed to do. You don't go shoot someone who's trying to steal your automobile. You call the police and you hope that it works out. But if someone's coming into your home and threatening your life, threatening your children's lives, you should be able to use your gun. And, and quite frankly, anybody that knows anything about firearms knows that if someone's coming in your house, either one person or multiple people, you don't have the time to take in the, in the darkness of night to load your firearm. You need to be ready to go. Let, let me switch gears here a little bit. I know this is something that we talked about this week. Uh, the deal that was struck by uh, several unions and the Murphy administration to cut their health care contributions from what would have been 20 percent down to 3 percent. And I know you were in the rare position of, of being on the same side uh, as public unions on this. Uh, but when you heard about this deal that saved uh, a lot of money for employees on the state level, um, it didn't really help people on the local level, right? In fact, it kind of left them adrift. It, it really has. And, and, and again, I, I'm all for, you know, again, I said it in the last interview with you, David, that our, our state workers, many of which were on the front lines the entire time during COVID-19, should be applauded. But I, I think of the private citizen that does not get that level of benefits who each and every year their health care costs have risen a minimum of 6%. And in reality, it's more than that with the rate of inflation that we have, the exorbitant cost of gas now in the United States of America. Obviously, our grocery prices have also suffered from exorbitant increases. They have been left in the dust. And, and I just, it, it concerns me, David, because we have the greatest outward migration of citizenry in the United States of America. And I will continue to say there eventually is going to be a straw that breaks the New Jersey taxpayers back. I don't know that this is the issue, but we really need to look at this issue because in the private sector, costs have gone up 6% every single year on average. And I just don't understand how state workers are somehow exempt from all of the conditions that affect private industry. So are, are, the, I mean, are we going to be forced into a situation where the governor has made an agreement that says, OK, it's 3 percent this year? It doesn't change the fact that costs are going up across the board, right? It, it doesn't do that at all. And I think, again, I think this is New Jersey kicking the can down the road for eventually there's going to be the piper has to get paid, right? I mean, eventually the piper is going to have to get paid. The claims have gone up. Healthcare costs have gone up. I don't understand how somehow state workers, and I'm happy for them that they're not getting hit with 24% because 
that you know that's a surprise and i said i think that these um fees have been kept artificially low for a number of years especially during an election year call me a cynic but uh, that's that's what i'll say about that david but i have to be honest with you eventually those costs are going to have to be transferred to the consumers, the state workers, and to the taxpayer. It's unavoidable. So then what do we say now to uh, local folks, firefighters, clerks in City Hall, people working in the health department for the municipality? What what can you say to them? I mean, I know this is not of your doing, but what can you say to them? I'm going to say you're going to have to prepare for the worst because eventually— they can't be this, you know, the special class and not have to bear more of the cost, just like the private sector is continuing to do every year. The can can't be kicked down the road forever, and eventually the piper will be paid. And what's that it's mean? Have to happen, so they have to prepare for it. What What's that mean uh, generally? If you had to kind of look into the future, what's that going to mean to the person in Middletown who is going to see their next tax bill? What should they expect? Well, what they should expect is there's going to be an increase. And, and, and for the public sector worker, there's one of two things can happen. Either their benefits are going to be cut eventually or their costs are going to go up or a little bit of both. I mean, there's going to have to be a very serious discussion. And I hope and pray, David, that it's going to be a bipartisan discussion in both houses of the legislature where we sit down and really try to figure out health care costs across the board because we can't continue down this road to perdition. Eventually, there is going to be that 24% increase, whether we like it or not, it's going to have to be had. All right, you used that B word, bipartisanship. Senator Mike Testa, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on with us. Thank you so very much, David, always a pleasure.